We're on lesson three, and we do still have a few books up here in case you all, some of you didn't get a book. We have, we have my Bible in the floor. Uh, but we do have a few books if, if any of you want to take one with you as you leave today. Uh, the Hands of Jesus. Uh, when I think about the Hands of Jesus, I immediately go, because we know that Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. And when I think about the hands of the Lord, I think about how that his hands reach down into the dust of the earth and begin to shape and form man. And then I, when I think about the hands of Jesus, I think about the nail prints in his hands. There's a lot of things you think about when you think about the hands of Jesus. But what we're looking at today how that, that in a world that where a lot of people uh, were, were that felt unloved, that felt that nobody cared, that no one uh, would even reach out and touch them, the Lord's hands reached out and touched them. We're going to be talking a little bit about the Jesus and the leopards today. And um, I, uh, there was a little story at the beginning of, of my Sunday school book. It, was, it wasn't in your, your book. So I thought, you know, this would be something um, nice to talk about as far as, as the hands of the Lord and how he reached out to so many people. It didn't matter their status in life, you know, where they had been, even what they were at the time. And uh, as I talked about last Sunday, and I think I even said this, there's the song that says, he saw not what I was, but he saw what I could be. And that's the way the Lord did back in, even in the days when he walked here on this earth. And this story says we don't know where she lived or, it, or if she even had a home. We don't know where Jesus found her, but wherever she was and whatever her status or her circumstances were, she must have been a miserable woman. She likely heard voices uh, in her head or experienced sleepless nights with thoughts of self-harm or violence. And if we could go back in time, we wouldn't be surprised to see a woman that looked very wild-eyed. Um, maybe she uh, was a woman that probably even talked to herself, and even if others tried to approach her, she probably gave them a... A, a, a snap of an answer those that came near her can anybody guess what woman I'm talking about probably not but her name was Mary she was from Mag Magdala and she had seven demons living inside of her but along came Jesus although she uh, is mentioned in, in all four gospels uh, we don't find any specific details of his encounter with Mary but the Bible simply tells us in Luke 8 and 1 that he, and it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him and certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. And then he mentions her name, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. So at some point, Jesus cast seven devils out of Mary and her life it must have been a mess before Jesus touched her. Right. We're talking about the hands of Jesus today. And Mary is a, gla a classic example of how drastic, drastically that Jesus can change a life. And if we could hear testimonies even from you all today, we would know that you are here because the Master touched your life. Um, and the Bible, t uh, our lesson told us that Mary is mentioned by her name, 12 times in the gospel. I never thought about that. I hadn't done my research, but somebody had. And uh, so 12 times her name was mentioned in the four gospels, which is uh, more than most of the disciples or other non-family women in Jesus' life. So Mary traveled with the Lord and was at his crucifixion and at his burial. And also she was there after he was resurrected. And uh, not many people had that privilege, but somehow or another, Mary stayed close to the Lord. Um, I want to think it was because the transformation that he, that touch had upon her life. Yeah. Where she had been tormented by the devil, she had been possessed by the devil, now she was set free, and she wanted to stay close to the one that had set her free. Woo! Right. Folks, I just want to tell you, that's a little lesson for us today. Yes. Tell us where we need to, who we need to stay close to. Yes. Uh, uh, having gone uh, the, the greatest honor let, let me get back to my lesson today I, I get a little sidetracked when I think little thoughts in with these, these notes that I have 
uh, the, perhaps the greatest honor of her life was being the first person Jesus appeared to after his resurrection. Now, can I just throw this in here? Is it all right if I say this? You don't know what I'm going to say, so you don't know if you want me to see if you want to say yes or not. <laughs> but if you think about it, really, Mary was the first to carry the message of his resurrection. I'm just saying, she was a woman. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. Y'all know where I'm coming from. Is that all right? Um, having gone to his tomb with the other women on the morning that Jesus rose from the dead, Mary and the others found his tomb empty. So they began to leave to go tell the disciples. But evidently, Mary kind of stayed back there in the garden alone at some point in that morning because three of the Gospels uh, tells us that she spoke with the Lord himself but she thought he was the gardener, you know. Uh, then she recognized his voice and became overwhelmed with emotion. And perhaps Mary was more passionate toward the Lord because he had shown her such great mercy by touching her life when she was untouchable. Isn't that awesome? When nobody else could touch her, Jesus touched her. And the Lord, he is still willing to touch and heal people that society have cast aside today. And, and in today's lesson, we're going to be studying about such a group of people that had been cast aside because they were unclean. They were called lepers. And I just want to tell you, not too many people want to reach out and touch somebody if they know they've got the, the disease of leprosy. But our Lord did. So as we glean from the scriptures today, we see how that lepers were one of the, the oldest known groups of outcasts. They were they were required by the law. It was, it was a law that they stay away from others. And we're going to see in the scripture how that uh, this separation, it wasn't because people were prejudiced about them, but it was because it was the law. The law required it. And in Leviticus 13, 42, 46, we read about this. It says in verse 42, If there be in the bald head or bald forehead a white reddish sore, it is a leprosy sprung up in his bald head or his bald forehead. Then the priest shall look upon it, and behold, if the rising of the sore be white reddish in his bald head or in his uh, bald forehead, as the leprosy appeareth in the skin of the flesh, he is a leprous man. He is unclean. The priest shall pronounce him utterly unclean. His plague is in his head, and the leper in whom the plague is his clothes shall be rent, his head bare, and he shall put a covering uh, upon his upper lip and shall cry, Unclean, unclean. All the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled, he is unclean. He shall dwell alone, without the camp shall his habitation be. I think sometimes we read these stories about these people in the condition that they're in, and they, we think, well, that, that was a sad situation to be in. But they lived day after day, away from their loved ones. You know, when, when, when families get together, we all hug each other and say, oh, I'm glad to see you, da-da-da, you know, and, and we're excited. But they, they, couldn't, they couldn't go home on Father's Day, brother. I know there wasn't a Father's Day, I'm sure, back in there. But if there had have been, they couldn't go home to be with their family on Father's Day. Now, that sounds sad to me. That, that's sad. But it wasn't just Father's Day that they were annihilated from their family. It was every day they woke up, they knew it was going to be the same routine. And if anybody <laughs> came near them, the law said they had to cry out those words, unclean, unclean, because no one could come near them. So uh, their, their skin disease was, was easily transmitted to others, and it would infect someone else. <laughs> Uh, and so the uncleanness, it was, it was a medical issue. It wasn't just the, the fact that they were looked down upon and, and counted, you know, you know bad. But, but it, was, it, was, it was physically and medically. They, they were, they were in, a, in a contagious stage that no one could, could dare be around them. Only somebody else that was a leper could be around them. So um, the, the quarantine of the lepers... It wasn't designed to, to devalue them, in other words, uh, that had that, that disease, but it was, it was actually, it was for the safety of those others that would, would even venture near them. So people are often defined by things that publicly manifest in their lives. Someone who is painfully shy may be viewed as socially challenged. 
you know, and sometimes, let me just say this about people that are shy. Sometimes, do you know that people that are shy, people think they're stuck up? Can you believe that? Can you believe that? That's how we rate people, though. Well, they just think they're better than me. No, you really don't know. They're very shy, and they're very intimidated by other people. It's not that they're stuck up. They just don't know what to say. So we have to be careful how we categorize people. Is that okay to say that without being too bold and blunt about it? But if we're not careful, we'll just we'll put a stigma and hang a tag on people. Say, she thinks she's better than me. She won't even talk to me. No, sometimes people just don't know what to say, and it's just the truth. And there's other people that don't have that problem. They talk to anybody they want to. I tell pastor, you can just talk to anybody. He said, that's my business to talk. He said, you better hope I don't ever quit talking. <laughs> I mean, I don't, now I, older, the older I've gotten, it's not difficult for me to just speak to people. My children used to say when they were teenagers, Mama, you don't even know them. I said, well, what's wrong with being friendly? They get so embarrassed. Some of you mothers know what I'm talking about. Grandmas, you know what I'm talking about. Y'all been through that with your kids. They would get so embarrassed if I would talk to a total stranger. I'm just trying to be friendly. Let them know that I'm, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a person that's not stuck up. But there's been times that people probably thought I was stuck up because I didn't say anything. But it, I have found if you don't have anything to say, if you try to say something, sometimes it comes out very stupid. <laughs> yeah. Anybody done that before? And then you think, why didn't I just shut my mouth and not even bother with that? I know y'all have been guilty, right? Hallelujah. Amen. I ain't the only dumb one around here that don't know what to say to people sometimes. And I think, oh, why did I even say that? Just trying to converse, trying to be friendly, trying to be nice, and then you just put your foot right square in your mouth. Mm. Mm. <laughs> that could go a long ways with that thought, but I better get back to the lesson today. Uh, especially if you ask somebody when's their baby. <laughs> Y'all have never done anything like that, I know. I say, oh, you and your husband. Never, never mind, never mind. Let's, let's get off that. <laughs> let's get off that rabbit. Uh, <laughs> but y'all, y'all, y'all are relating. Okay, okay. Uh, but then there's there there are uh, there are there may be even legitimate issues that 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 are at play in the lives of people who who have addictions who make bad lifestyle choices. And, and it, it isn't wrong to be aware of the challenges some people have, and, and it isn't wrong to set boundaries when it comes to unhealthy relationships, but it is wrong, folks, to discard people who have such issues or to regard these people as irredeemable, as a lost cause. You know, we cannot, we cannot put tags on people and, and describe them if they have some mental issues, folks. There's people that have, we're living in a society where there's a whole lot of mental issues like we've never seen before. I mean, really, really, there are. There are people that we don't even, we just kind of push them off and say, they are crazy as a Bessie bug. I'm just being honest. I'm being for real, folks. And we just kind of pass them on by. They've got some issues. They need somebody to reach out and touch them. I'm not so much talking about physically, but reach out to them with love and care and concern. And so we're talking about the hands of Jesus where he touched people that other people wouldn't even dare come near them because of their uncleanness. And so lepers, as we talked about a while ago, they lived outside the camp. They were told they had to stay away from everybody else. They had to stay in their own little group. And... As a result, there were leper colonies back in the day, and, and I understand in some countries there still are leper colonies. Um, and due to their, to all of the problems of their uh, physical medical situation, uh, also I believe it caused some emotional problems within them. Uh, not only did they have physical problems, I believe they had emotional problems. Uh, how humiliated and how hopeless these lepers must have felt uh, as they were required to cry out, unclean, unclean, to everybody passing close by them. And, and, and 
and, and to know that they had to suffer the consequences of, of everybody just walking away from them and, and probably walking away whispering, did you see? Did you see his face? Did you see his hands missing? They probably overheard some of those conversations as people walked away from them that, that people, you know, were talking about them. To feel that emotional pain, not just the physical, I'm sure the pain was physically probably unbearable, but then that emotional pain. But we're talking about Jesus, who was willing to touch those that were untouchable. Um, you know, there, there's people today that, that have emotional problems. Maybe even, even a grown man might would have the feeling of, of feeling stupid because emotionally he was... Uh, as a child, he was berated. I, I told one of my grandchildren the other day that was calling their baby whiny baby. I said, don't you call him that. Don't you call him a whiny baby. <laughs> well, he is, Mama. I said, well, don't you call him that. I said, he may be a whiny baby. Listen, what you say to your children stays with them their whole life. Instead of saying something negative, we say something positive. Now, I know y'all don't want to hear about me, how I raise my kids, but if there was something they wanted to do that I said no to, I would find something that they could do that I would say yes to. If you find something negative about your child, then you turn it around and find something positive to praise them with. We don't, we don't curse our children, we bless our children. Is that okay? Uh, and then, then there are those that maybe as a teenager... They were, they were threatened by, uh, by the fact that they, they felt like they were inferior to everybody and, and they didn't know how to communicate and they even felt maybe, maybe felt invisible, like, you know, nobody even notices me. You know, we don't know what's going on in people's minds today, especially our youth. You know, people can put on a good face. Yeah. We do sometimes ourselves, don't we? How are you today? Oh, fine. And you may be feeling like a dirt bag. But you smile and say, oh, fine. And then when they walk away, you go, am I right? Yeah. But, but our children, you know, we, we don't know what's going on in their minds. Or maybe a, a, a person that is a recluse who's become somebody that lives on the streets, maybe because of different things that happened in their life. Maybe they were bullied. Maybe they felt like, you know, they... Have you ever heard anybody say, I'm the black sheep of the family? Anybody heard that? You don't hear that much anymore. But but people people see themselves they and you know you know really people you know the, the let me get this out most of our worst people that we have a problem with is walking in the shoes that number eight and a half that I wear here's the one I have the most problem with I don't have any problem with y'all I give myself problems I can talk myself down and feel like I need to crawl under the carpet instead of walking on top of the carpet. I can, I can, I can do that to myself. None of y'all do that to yourself, but I can do that to myself. I can say, well, I'm not fit for nothing. I'm no good. I'm a failure at this. I da da. You say, Sister Crazy, you? Yes, absolutely. I'm just as human as everybody else sitting right here today. Or I can turn it around and I say, God never created junk. And I tell you something else I read this week, and I thought it was so good. I wrote it down. If I don't write things down, I forget it, and even when I write it down, I still forget it. <laughs> but it says, if you are thinking negative thoughts, they did not come from God. I needed that. I said, Sister Christy, you think negative Oh, yes, I do about me. I'm thinking about you, but I think I'm about me. But I'm going to tell you, they didn't come from the Lord. And the enemy, what he wants to do, he wants you to just keep on thinking those negative thoughts. Right. So you, instead of walking out, you feel like you ought to just crawl out as low as you are. Right. Yeah. Like our pastor used to say, like a snake in a wagon rut. Right. Uh, you know, just feel that low down. Anybody? No, I ain't going to ask that. Go ahead. Been there, done that. But God's love extends to those who are unclean today. God isn't like everyone else, and neither are God's people, Okay. 1 Peter 4 and 8 says, and above all things, everybody say above all things. Above all things. Have fervent charity. Now that word you know means love. 
among yourselves, for charity does what? Shall cover the multitude of sins. You know, uh, love makes a way, folks. It provides a way of escape. Love is what rescues people from the leper colonies of sin. Right. Love is what rescues people from abuse and abandonment and wrong choices. The love of God does. And we, we as God's people, we've got to show God's love to people that other people consider unclean. That's right. Now we're gonna we're gonna talk about the Good Samaritan. I mean, not the Good Samaritan, but the Samaritan woman next Sunday. But you know, I hear a little bit about her last Sunday and the leopards too. But you know, Jesus went out of his way to touch people that he knew that nobody else would even give the time of day to. I've heard our pastors say, if the Lord was walking physically on this earth, he probably wouldn't be walking here today. He would be going down and finding that man that's laying out in the gutter that, that is laying in his vomit, and he would be out there touching him today. You're right. Woo. That's exactly right. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost, and he rejoices over the one more than the 99 that needeth no repentance. He loves us, folks, but I'm going to tell you, he loves the untouchable today. Amen. 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 So the Apostle Paul, he, he talked about that word charity in 1 Corinthians 13. And notice how the actions of love mentioned, how they relate one to another. In 1 Corinthians verse 4, uh, chapter 13, it says, charity suffered long. In other words, when, when you've got the love of God in your heart, that gives you the ability to be long-suffering and patient with people that don't have the love of God in their heart. That's right. Y'all are real quiet right now. Y'all know what I'm going to say next, do you? But if anybody ever was long-suffering with people that needed to, be to have somebody be patient with, God's people are those people. That's right. Because after all, Romans 5 and 5 says... And hope maketh not a shame for the love of God, because the love of God is shed abroad in our in our hearts. How? Holy. By the Holy Ghost. When we've been born again of the water and the Spirit, we've got what it takes to have that love that is long suffering. That's right. yeah. That is uh, that suffers long. And and guess what else? And is kind. Right. Is kind. Ooh, sometimes, sometimes it. I, I, I believe sometimes not only does our faith get challenged, but our love level gets challenged. That's right. How we treat other people. You know, I know you don't have any songbooks to throw at me, so I'm not going to say that, but don't throw nothing at me, okay? But sometimes we can, treat a, we can smile at a complete stranger and frown at our companion or our kids or our brother-in-law, our son-in-law. I love you guys. I, only, I got two right here now. One's over there and one's coming later, I hope. So, so the love of God causes us to be kind to people. And, and then, then charity, charity will cause us not to envy what other people have. In other words, sometimes if we're not careful, We'll think, how come they don't even live for God and look what all they got and here I'm trying to struggle and I, what's going on with this? Yeah. But the love of God tells us we're not to do that. You know, it doesn't matter. Here's the way I see it. Godliness with contentment is great gain. That's what the word of God tells me. What God has blessed you with is exactly what you can handle. I live in a one-story house. I've lived there almost 40 years. It ain't a mansion, but it's just what God knew that I could live with and still not feel, oh, we're going to get on down here. Charity vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed up. In other words, I'm better than them because look what I've got. They, don't, they're just, they just live in a shack by the side of the road. My sweet little old mama lived, she worked hard her whole life to, to raise us kids, and she raised us on a, uh, what, what people would call minimum wage. I never saw my mama get out and pick it for a raise in her life. 
She chose not to take any kind of government assistance. She wow. raised us kids the best she could with what little bit of work she, you know, what could she could do at the Baptist Hospital. When she, she passed away, she lived in a little farmhouse that didn't even have water until my husband uh, and, and my dad put water there in the house for Mama to have running water. She retired from Baptist Hospital. She had nothing as far as this world to show, as far as worldly goods. But my mama was as happy walking down a path to an outhouse until, until they got water in her house. That she just, it was hers, Sister Norton. We had rented there in Memphis all those years that us kids was growing up there in Memphis. We didn't grow up on the right side of the tracks, but we grew up with a godly mama that taught us how to pray and taught us how to trust in God. And the way I see it, I'm as rich as the most. You know, the little girl that I went to school with, she had all the Barbie dolls. She had the, back in those days, they were Kremlins. Y'all don't know what that is, but it made the little girls poof out their little skirts. I never owned a Kremlin in my life. But I tell you what, I thought that little girl was the richest little girl in all the world, but she wasn't. I was the richest little girl because I had a mama that taught me the ways of God and taught me what was really important in life. And it wasn't called things. It was called a walk with God. Amen. Amen. Laying up treasures in heaven. And I know that's what my mama knew, that she didn't have a lot down here, but she was laying up treasures in heaven. And I tell you, that's a testimony to me. Y'all think we got the craziest Sunday school teacher this world ever had. But I'm just telling you what's important, folks. It ain't your CDs and it ain't your bank account. It's your love of Jesus down inside of you that causes you to love everybody and treat everybody the way you want to be treated. So if you, if you came in here this morning thinking, woe is me and I don't have anything to show for ever how many years I've been living. If you've got Jesus Christ in your heart, you're a rich individual today. And you ought to thank him for it. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> thank you, Lord. I know I got off my notes, didn't I? I'm sorry, y'all. I, I, but, but I'm talking about the love of God. Uh, it's not puffed up. and does not behave itself unseemly. Seek of not her own. It's not easily provoked. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Sometimes people can rub our feathers or our fur the wrong way. And oh, boy, can we let them have it. Yeah. Maybe not vocally, but we, if looks could kill, they'd be dead as a doornail. I'm saying it. I'm saying it. I ain't taking it back because it's the truth. It's the truth. We're talking about the love of God that we got to show to people. Um, it seeketh not our, it's not thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth. I think I need to stop with that right there. Thinketh no evil. Ooh. Ooh. Boy, does that hit home. Sometimes we just have stinking thinking going on in our minds when it comes to other people. If they don't look and act and, and comb their hair the way we think they should, we can just, man, we can, we can just, we can just be right, up, right, right in our thoughts. Right, don't even say a word. I've heard people say, well, if you're going to think it, you might as well say it. Uh-uh, you better not go by that theory. Because you can repent of your thoughts, but once you hurt somebody with these words, yeah. right. we used to say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me, but that was the biggest lie we ever said. Because words can cut you to the heart. And you can't take them back. Man, I'm getting a whole lot of amens here. Whew, I know that's, I know you're telling it right, Sister Creasy. What else does charity do? Charity doesn't rejoice. Let me read it the way the scripture says it. We're talking about charity. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Verse 6 is where I'm reading from. Folks, if we ever got a desire to get truth down inside of us, we need it now in this day and hour. Because we're living in a society where they're calling everything evil good, and everything that's good, they're calling it evil. That's the world we're living in. And we better know what thus saith the word of the Lord. We, we better let that law, let God let that law. In other words, we better get full of the Holy Ghost. 
let that Jeremiah 31 31 says he, and he'll write the law in their hearts right. we better get the word we better get the Holy Ghost down inside of us moving us amen like we never have a, if we ever saw spiritual giants we need to be seeing some spiritual giants I know we've had spiritual giants in the past there's been brother Herschel go there is that was that y'all's pastor back in the day we there, there's been a Hazel Simpson that was back in y'all's day there's been a Jack Chester that was back in our days there's been many many people back in our days that we consider spiritual giants but I'm telling you we need some spiritual giants walking among us in 2022 like we never have before Amen. Amen. Yeah. sometimes I just want to get a little preachy and forget about teaching go ahead. Go ahead. and just go ahead. yell it instead I of tell it but I'm telling you we need some spiritual giants in the Covington United Pentecostal Church somebody that will get down before God and intercede like we've never seen them intercede before that you can't even talk to people for talking to God speaking in that heavenly language I'm telling you we need spiritual giants among us and I just wonder who among us is willing to let the Holy Ghost use you like that yes. Woo, hallelujah hallelujah amen here's something else charity does in verse 7 it says beareth all things Ooh. Sometimes we feel like, God, I just don't think I can make another step. I've carried this, this, this situation so long, I just don't know if I can make another step. But what does the love of God do? It helps us to bear all things. And look what else it does. It, help us, it helps us, it believeth all things. Believeth all things. If we ever had rock solid faith, we need that rock solid faith now. Amen. Folks, we're living in trouble sometimes. Right. I know, I know that we've heard it before. I know. Don't you know Noah kept telling them, folks, it's going to rain. Folks, it's going to rain. I'm building this ark so you don't have to die in the flood. And they're saying, that guy is a nut. Right. It ain't What is rain? And we're saying the Lord's coming. And people are saying, oh, I've heard that all my life. I have too. But one of these days, it's really going to happen. And I believe we're living in that day. You can believe what you want to, but I, I choose to believe we're living in that day. And, and it's time we believe what the Word of God tells us. You see, what's wrong is we're listening to too many other voices. That's what's wrong with our society today. Mm. No, I ain't going but, but look here. What else does, does, does charity or hope or love do? It hopeth all things. You see, we're, we, there's some, some things that we don't see. You know, we're praying about things. We're believing God about things. So there's times we're just hoping. Brother Russian, we're hoping for that lost loved one to come in. We're hoping uh, for this situation to change. We're hoping uh, that, that we're going to see an influx of souls. Uh, and so what does, what does Ch charity do? It hopes for all things. It hopeth all things. And then what else does charity do? It endureth all things. Folks, there's some things that, that we're going to have to endure. We're going to have to go through it. But Jesus tells us, the word of God tells us, when we go through the fire, he'll be with us in the fire. When we go through the flood, he'll be with us in the flood. It's not going to overrun us. I'm telling you, we've got to have that perfect love down inside of us that causes us to endure the things that we're going to have to endure. And that we are enduring now. Some of you and all of us are enduring some things that we've never had to endure before. That's right. Okay, you can say amen, but it's the truth. So, so we're talking about the love of God, God's love that extends, and, and the love of God that is to, to extend from you and I. You see here, God is willing to touch and heal people that society would, would, would just set aside. We know that Jesus was God manifested in the flesh. We know that. He came into this world to seek and to save the lost. We know that. He also came to demonstrate how we should live. Uh, Jesus was known for his associating with sinners and those that were outcasts. And, and he wasn't even afraid to reach out and touch the lepers that he came in contact with, those that society had cast aside. And here's the beautiful part, Brother Mark. They weren't afraid to approach him. That's right. Now that's profound. You know why a lot of people don't come to the Lord? Sometimes it's because they're afraid that he'll reject them. Where did they get that idea? Right. 
Well, I know, I know, I know one's called the devil. Right. Yeah. Uh-huh. You can't be saved. You've done this and you've done that. Well, that's a flat out lie. Right. right. That is. That's right. Mark 1 and 40 says, and there came a leper to him. He wasn't afraid to approach Jesus. He didn't say, unclean, unclean. No. He came to Jesus, beseeching him, and look what he did, and kneeling down to him. Brother Billy, I believe he got right down in front of Jesus. Everybody else, he had to stay on. He, he knew he had to stay. But he knew there was his hope was right there. Kneeling at Jesus' feet. Can I just tell us today, that's where our hope is today. Kneeling at the feet of Jesus. Oh, and say unto him, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Look what Jesus said. The Bible said, and Jesus moved with compassion. Compassion. Oh, my goodness. That word compassion means that the Lord felt his pain. He felt what that, that leper. How could he do that? He's God manifest in the flesh. He knows how you feel this morning, Brother Michael. He knows all about you. He knows, Sister Cindy, what you are going through. And Sister Patricia, he knows you, Brother John Plummer. God knows you, Sister Debbie Plummer. God knows. He knows every one of us individually. He knows what's down inside of us. And he's the one that we need to do just like the leper. When we've got a situation, bring it to the foot of, uh, at his feet. We some say bring it to the foot of the cross. But just just and, and here, here, here he's saying, if thou will, thou canst make me clean. Somehow this man had either heard about Jesus and his healing power. I don't know really if he could have got close enough, folks, to see Jesus do a miracle. What about it? What do you think? I, I think somehow or another, maybe somebody stood way out there and said, hey. Hey, there's a man named Jesus. If you'll, if you'll get to him somehow or another, he'll heal you of this leprosy. Right. That's very popular. I believe he had to hear it from somebody because, right. you know, I don't, I don't think he had gotten, he couldn't get, I, I don't know. I, you know, your mind can, can I, I don't know how, how, but somehow, somehow this leper somehow expressed his faith when he spoke these words of confidence about the Lord's healing power. Uh, and, 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 and he was saying, Lord, if you want to, you can make me well again. And, and that's so beautiful that he had that, that confidence in his God. Folks, can I just tell us that's the kind of confidence that we need right now. Yes. You say, well, I'm not a leper. No, but there's things that you need help with. Right. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. If you're breathing, there's things you need from God. Jesus was moved with compassion in that verse 41 there. I don't think I read it, did I? And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and did what? He did what? He touched him. He touched that man that was contagious, that man that was contaminated, that man that could transmit a disease. To anybody else that touched him, Jesus touched him. The Bible said, and saith, now notice that word, S-A-T-S-I-T-H, saith unto him, I will be thou clean. Now the reason I want you to notice that is because there's something else we're fixing to read about. But don't, don't take that down just yet, Brother Mark. Uh, Jesus was moved with compassion. He was aware of the man's suffering and he felt sympathy or pity for him. Uh, but go, put this one up there, but I want you to come back to 41 again. Psalms 86 and 15 says, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of what? Compassion and gracious and long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. Folks, the same God that was there that walked the shores of Galilee, that touched that, that man that day, he's the same God that's here today that is full of compassion He's gracious, he is long-suffering, and he's plenteous in mercy and truth. God's got what you and I need for today's need. Amen. And as the children of God, we are to be moved by God's compassion on behalf of the people that God wants to touch. 
As we read there in verse 41, Mark 141, if you'll put that up there again, Brother Mark, if you don't mind, we see how that Jesus was so moved with compassion that he did the unthinkable thing and he touched the unclean leper, moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him. You know, Jesus didn't do this carelessly. He touched the man for the purpose of healing him. And notice the next thing that Jesus did was to speak to the leper in Mark 1.42. And as soon, that's what I want you to, to notice, and as soon as he had spoken, not as soon as he touched, but as soon as he had spoken, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word in flesh was standing before that leper that day, and when he spoke the Word, that God-breathed Word, that's when, the Bible said, and as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. Wow, wow. That's the power of the God that we serve today. Amen. That all he has to do, Brother Roy Norton, is speak the word. What we have to do is do what the leper man did and come to Jesus and bring our need to him and say, if thou will, thou canst make me whatever that need might be. Mm. Mm. Oh. And all he has to do is speak the word. So uh, Jesus wasn't afraid of what others might, have, might say about the mercy he showed to outcasts. Let me just say this. You know what holds us back from, from being obedient to God a lot of times is wondering what people are going to think. I got a lot of response on that. It is the truth. The Spirit of the Lord's moving. God begins to move on you. And he, he'll say, why don't you just walk around the building? And then there's that voice to say, everybody's going to think you're being pretty silly to do that. I'm going to tell you any time, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. For here's the thing, the devil's not going to tell you to do anything that's right. And he's not going to tell you to do anything that will bring a blessing to you. And sometimes just simply obeying, taking a walk around. Forget about everybody else. If you need something from God, do you think that leper was concerned about what everybody was going to think of him coming to Jesus? Eh, that was the last thought in that man's mind. What he wanted was what he got. And that's the way it works today. If you come asking and believing, you'll get what you, you came after. But if you come in doubting, you're going to do without. It just works. The same principle that works then works now. Old devil says, well, you got prayed for before and it didn't happen. Yeah, but you know how many times Elijah prayed before the rain came? It wasn't the first time he prayed. Y'all know the story. I don't have to tell you. So as, as believers, we've got to be ready to minister to anyone that God puts in our path. God looks on the heart, folks, and sees what we can't see. I'm going to stop right there because I'm, I'm on whoa right there because sometimes God tells us to do things and we say, I don't know what they're going to think if I go over there and pray for them. You don't know. They may be saying, God, let somebody come over here and pray with me right now. And as I said a while ago, the devil ain't going to tell you to do nothing that's good that's right. That's right. He'll tell you, oh, just give them a piece of your mind. That's what the devil says. Oh, just show them how, just, show them, just give them a little bit of what they gave you. You know, that's what the devil does. Yeah. But blessings, uh, what, he don't, what the devil don't want is for you to be a blessing, and he don't want them to receive a blessing. Right. Okay, right. y'all didn't go to sleep on me. That's all right. You know, God has always searched for men and women who are willing to do his work regardless of public, of public opinion. I got a call yesterday standing in line at Walmart. Fix it. I think I was being checked out or fixing to be checked out at the line. 
got a call, urgent call. I need you to pray. What did I do? I bowed my head right there in that Walmart, and I prayed. Not to glorify me, but I'm just saying, sometimes we can't pick and choose our places when there's a need. That's right. And we got we got to be as willing to pray standing in Walmart checkout line as we are standing at the altar. You know, you know why some people don't get through to God and get the blessings they need? They too worry about other people around them. Why are they going to think if I lift my hands? Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you, that's what you need to do is lift your hands. Because the lifting of the hands means you're surrendering to God. It also means you're worshiping God. And the higher you raise your hand, I feel like it's the, the more you're submitting to him. Well, I know I've been there where this was my raising my hands because I was scared what everybody thought about me. But, Loney, i got to get a blessing. I need something from God. You just have to pardon me. I need a, I need a blessing. I need a miracle. So, so God's looking for, I, here's the, here's, let me ask you this question. Are you ready? Yeah. Will you be the hands of Jesus to people that society have cast aside? All Will right. you? All right. Will you? Will you? You don't have to answer me now, but think about it. The heart of the issue is how will we be the body of Christ on this earth? How will we be the body of Christ on this earth? How will we reach out to those around us? You know, God may want to use each of us to reach someone uh, that, that no one else is willing to reach. So our job isn't to calculate who we should reach out to. Our, our job is to say, God, whoever you put me in contact with, Lord, whoever you make available to me, that's the person that I want to minister to, not who I get to pick and choose. Oh, if I could, you know, maybe maybe God would use me to, to bless so-and-so, you know. They, they probably wouldn't think I was crazy if I wouldn't. Go. No, no. You just make yourself available to whomever God would have you to minister to. And I'm persuaded. Now, you may not be, but I'm persuaded when you say, God, if you will use me however I'm willing, once you say those words, be ready, because God's going to send somebody to you that you can minister to. Right. After all, you are the body of Christ. If, if, if I mash my finger, which I hope I don't, because that hurts, but usually if I mash my finger, you know what the first thing I do? I'm not going to do it right now, but I'll... You know, like stick it, I don't know what it does to your finger if you stick it in your mouth, but somehow or another you just feel like you've got to comfort it or something, you know. You know you, and I ain't the only one that does that, right? No. You know, you, you know, we try to comfort whatever part of that body, you know. You match it, you stump your toe, you sit down, you pick that toe up, you put it up in your lap, I mean, you comfort that. Oh, I dropped a gallon of baked beans on my toes down in the down the fellowship hall one day. And as soon as I, it hit my foot, I started saying, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. He said, well, that's crazy, Sister Greasy. No, 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 no. I'm thanking him that it didn't break my foot. You say, how you know it didn't break my foot? I don't know. I was just thanking him that it didn't. A gallon of baked beans hit the arch of my foot and hit my big toe. And I'm going to tell you the thank you Jesus worked. Because I was going. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All across the fellowship hall. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I got to the other end, put up whatever it was I was trying to put up, and started walking around. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You are a nut, Sister Creasy. I know it. But listen, listen here. How well the Lord took care of it. We was having a little get together downstairs. The family was, and I said, "Y'all know what?" And I stuck out the wrong foot. I said, "I dropped," and I saw it's this foot. A gallon of beans on my foot today. I, I stuck the wrong foot out there. When God does something, He does it good. There was still a mark on the arch, and there was still a mark on my toe, but there was no pain because I stuck the wrong foot out. I didn't remember which one I even hit. <laughs> hey, hey, I believe in this, Jesus. Amen. I live for him. A gallon of beans hit the arch of my foot. What should have happened, Sister Rebecca? It should have done some fracturing, if not broken. I always thought a fracture was a break. It's not. I don't know. Uh, but here's the thing. I've got three minutes. Here's the thing. i got three minutes. I'm just, I'm just telling you what happened to me. 
He said, oh, well, it just didn't hit right. It hit my toe and my arch. How else could it hit? And there was a concrete floor under my foot. Okay. So, so our job is to be, to be available to reach out and touch anyone God puts in our path. That's our job. And here's the thing. We are privileged to be blessing distributors in a world where people are in desperate need of blessings. Did you? I never thought about us being blessing distributors. Here you go. God bless you. God bless you. Have you ever tried when people ask you, how are you to say I'm blessed? Try it the next time. If you think about it, it's amazing the response you'll get from people. Because they, they relate to that. They, and there's some people that relate to it more than others. And they'll say yes and highly favored of the Lord. Yeah. But, but, but God, uh, here's the thing. Uh, all we need to do is just to pay close attention to our merciful God and his promptings to touch people that our cruel world has already shut out. Amen? If I were to ask you today this question, and I'm going to ask you, so be ready. Are you ready? ready. Who are some people we as a church need to become more aware of and compassionate toward? Can you think of any kind of people like that right now? Can you think of any one person, not just kind, but any one person that maybe that you know is hurting that needs somebody to show them compassion? That may be the person that God makes you, if you'll make yourself available, that may be the very one that, that God puts in front of you that you can be a blessing to, that you can touch that person. The Bible said, and this is our focus verse, Mark 1 and 41, and Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and said unto him, I will be thou clean. So I want to ask the Covington Church today, who are you going to reach out and have compassion on and touch? Even today, there may be somebody that you can reach out to today and be those hands that will bless and touch somebody else. What, what God needs is somebody that will love people that do not feel loved in this world today. There's somebody that God can use you to reach out to today. Just pray and make yourself available and be the hands of Jesus for somebody today. God bless you. Let the Lord use you. Amen.